seated. There is no friend like the lowly Jesus, and he invites us today to come and be his dinner guests, uh, not only at the potluck uh, afterwards, uh, but at his table uh, here this morning in the service. Mary Poplin is a professor at Claremont University, and she wrote in a, in a book, she's written a number of books um, about spiritual life, she, but she wrote about her testimony. And she was saved at a communion service because of communion. I, I love what she said. She said, the guy said, she had, you know, at that point, no contact with church. The guy, whoever that guy was up front, the guy said, you don't have to be a member of any church to take communion. You just have to believe that Jesus Christ lived, that he died for your sins, and that you have to want him in your life. She said, as the, as the service went along, as she, as she thought about what Jesus Christ had done, what the, what the table and, and its elements uh, represent, she, at that moment, turned her life over to Jesus, and she said, please come and get me, please come and get me, please come and get me. That's all she knew. You know, there's not much theology there, <laughs> except there's the deepest theology, I call upon Jesus. You know, Jesus says, if you just call upon him, if you just say, come and get me, you know, that is good enough. Jesus comes and gets us. Communion, the Lord's Supper, is just this amazingly powerful thing. It becomes sort of commonplace. Um, and, and we do it so often. Um, I, I, I know churches that do it once a week. Uh, couple of the churches I grew up in, they did it twice a year. Um, and I, I, I suppose no matter what you do, it can become routine. You can start to ignore it. But it needs to be an essential part of our life, this powerful experience. We're invited to a meal um, from God's ancient recipes uh, that will change us, that will give us his freedom and set us free from the bondage of sin that we have. Jesus built communion on the service of Passover, on the ritual of Passover. On the first day of the, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city. And a certain man would tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. For 1,500 years before this, the Jews had been celebrating Passover. Following these ancient traditions that Moses had outlined, following and remembering those things that had happened years before, because that table that they were, were eating at taught them these great truths about our great need and God's great salvation. God's deliverance of the Israelites uh, was the basis of this. He had given them nine other plagues, and then on the tenth plague, he sends this uh, Passover angel, this death angel, and if they celebrated Passover the way they were supposed to, their families survived. If they did not, tragedy hit them. It was a meal of strange recipes and flavors, and you've probably seen most of these and heard most of these. They had salt water uh, to remind them of the tears that they shed while they were slaves in Egypt. They had bitter herbs like horseradish to remind them of the sour flavor of the bondage that they had. They had a fruit paste um, made out of apples and with some cinnamon sticks, set, reminding them that they used to have to make bricks without straw. Um, there was a meal of lamb, remembering how the lamb was killed, and they brushed this, the blood of this lamb over their doorposts so that the angel would pass over them. Uh, and there was flatbread made without yeast to remind God's people that they needed to be ready for the journey. They had to, didn't have time to let it rise. They just had to get it and go. You know, the first fast food. And then there were four cups of wine that became more a part of the tradition of the service uh, throughout the meal. These are based on four promises that God gave to them in Exodus chapter 6. I will bring you out. I will free you from being slaves. I will redeem you. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Uh, the last promise, the fourth promise is this whole thing. Those four promises 
were precious to those people. And that each time they, they had a, a cup of wine during, this, during the meal, they would read that passage and they would remember that promise to them. The Passover gives us and gave the disciples a taste, a taste of the ways of God. How is God going to behave in the future? Yes, we need a sacrifice to, to cleanse us from sin. Yes, we are slaves uh, to sin, just as they were slaves to the Egyptians. And in all of this, God is teaching us some immortal truths. Sin is like Egypt. You know, it's just like an endless making of bricks without straw, just frustrating and unrewarding and ends in nothing. That's sin. It is nothing in this world. It reminded them that death will pass uh, over every house and, and into our lives, but that Jesus Christ can, through being the sacrificial lamb, help us to conquer sin and to receive newness of life. It reminded them that God is redeeming God, buying people out of slavery. In their case, it was literal, physical slavery. In every case, it is slavery from the bondage of sin. We are slaves to sin. Not as bad as we could be, but we can't escape it. We can't get it away from it. He is a liberating God. He sent them out victoriously and with great promises of, of a land flowing with milk and honey. Did they follow up on those promises? No. But God made them those promises. It's just as he has given us a promise of eternal life. They learned their theology at a dinner table. That's a great place to learn theology. I think most of us learn our theology there. Now Jesus wanted to teach his disciples uh, that that table, that Passover service, was just the appetizer, or just the hors d'oeuvres for the main course that was coming in a day. The next day would be the real meal. The next day would be the real blessing. Jesus brings his disciples to the Passover me meal on, on the eve of his death. So it would get them a taste. So that it would just start to whet their appetite. So that they would want more of what he has to offer. Now, this meal that he offers to us, that he wants us to join in, is a meal that is going to expose our hearts. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were, there, they, they were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, yes, it's you. Now, it continues in verse 31. 31 is actually part of the next chapter, but I, I wanted to co cover this verse as well. Then Jesus told them this very night, you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. What a strange party. <laughs> One guest is dry, driven away, you know, out into the dark. All of them are upset. They're very disturbed at what's going on. And the host, he is, he is grieved. He is, he's got a broken heart because of what's going on here. This is not the kind of party that the Passover normally was. It was usually a joyous celebration, but this one was different. Communion is not a safe meal. If anything that this passage tells us is that this is not a safe thing to do. What happened on that, on that solemn evening usually happens whenever this meal is eaten. We are confronted with who we are, slaves to sin, betrayers, people who forsake Jesus, scattered folks, folks who need help. It happens every time. At this meal, the pretender, the fake, the betrayer can't hide. At communion, the betrayer cannot hide. Jesus saw in Judas something that no one else saw. Now, later on, they, they realize that he'd been stealing, and John writes about that, and, 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 and they have other things that, that they talk about Judas. But really, at the, at the time, they didn't understand. They thought, oh, he's going to go out and buy something when he left. 
Oh, yeah, Jesus sent him on an errand. Well, Jesus did send him on an errand, but it wasn't a, anything good. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul issues a very solemn warning about the dangers of this meal, about the dangers of, of, of eating this meal and being a fake. And he says that some of them had gotten sick because they had eaten communion uh, unworthily. Uh, some of them had even died because they had eaten communion unworthily. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't take communion if you have sin in your life, if you're a sinner, because then nobody would be able to take part of communion. <laughs> well, anybody want to raise their hand? <laughs> no, I could. <laughs> no, nobody. You know, that's not what it means. What it means is that betrayers had better not dine here. People who are fake, who who don't really know Jesus, who don't love Jesus, who don't serve him, trust him, follow him, they better be careful, or this meal is poison. It's nothing good, because it exposes our hearts. At this meal, every believer is invited to examine their hearts. Who are we? What have we done? Are we betrayers? Is it I, Lord? Yeah. Yeah. The stunning news that there, was, that there was a betrayer among them grieved the disciples. They, they were shocked. They did not understand this. You know, later on, you know, as we do, we go back and look at Judas' life, and they probably went back and looked at Judas' life. Oh, yeah, I, I always knew. But they had no clue what was going on. The, the New Living Translation puts it, I'm not the one. Am I, Lord? I'm not the one. They all thought it might be them because... Frankly, it, it could be any one of us. It was a question that they expected a negative answer to. No, 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 of course not. No, 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 it's not you. Except Matthew never records Jesus' answer. And I think he does that on purpose. He doesn't say, you know, when Matthew comes up to him and says, is it, is it me? And, and Jesus said, no, no, it was, it's not going to be you. He doesn't record that. He might have said it. But what Matthew is trying to do here is to say, you know, it could be any one of us. It could be any one of us. And it oftentimes is because we have sin in our lives and we betray the Lord through our sins. No answer is recorded. The fact was that only, while only one would betray him, they all would forsake him. They would all turn their backs on him. G Peter denied Jesus three times. You know, they all ran and hid when push came to shove. Eventually told them this, this, eventually told them this in verse 31. This very night, all of you will fall away on account of me. No one is safe. John tells us that these disciples quickly moved from this shocked question of, is, is it me, to who is the greatest? Well, you know, well, Jesus didn't say it was me, so I must be the greatest here. You know, how <laughs> strange. It is just an amazing segue in, in that whole conversation that they go from thinking that they could betray Jesus to the fact that they were the greatest in the kingdom of God. There's a sense in which this meal is supposed to bring out the worst in us. It doesn't provoke the worst in us. It doesn't make us sin, but it exposes just how bad we are. And we are all pretty bad. Jesus' own profound, profound suffering started at this, this at this table. Um, there are a couple of things in these verses that, that I'd like to point out this morning, unless we miss them. First one is in verse 23. Jesus said, the one who dips his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The point is, is that they had all dipped their hand into the bowl. And whether it is the bowl of the fruit paste, or whether it was the bowl containing the meat, or whether it was the bowl containing the bitter herbs, they had all participated with Jesus. Um, that's what friends did. You participate. You eat with each other. We eat with each other today at, at, at lunchtime. We're friends. We do this. Jesus was saying, my betrayer is one of my friends. You know, Michael Card wrote, you know, how could a, how could a friend betray a friend? Well, uh, a stranger has nothing to gain. Only a friend can betray a friend. Jesus was betrayed 
by his friend. Another thing lost on us was that Jesus was the host of this meal. And they had very strict rules and, 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 and very serious rules about hospitality. You know, if, if a stranger came to your door, you had to offer them hospitality. But if somebody was there at the meal, you didn't insult the host. They were the host. You didn't criticize them. You didn't attack them. You didn't do anything. At this meal, Jesus is not only, I guess, criticized, he is betrayed. A huge violation in their world. A huge violation of what they did. In order for Jesus to drink the full cup of human suffering, he had to know what it was like for a friend to betray him. One of the most grievous things that there is. He had to know and understand that. And the betrayal of a dear friend was part of that suffering. Psalm 41 says, Even my close friend, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus loved Judas. He loves every sinner. Even the one who betrayed him and I cannot imagine what Jesus was going through when he talked to, to Judas and said, it's you. When he realized that this dear friend of his was going to betray him in such a way that there was no recovery and that his friend would suffer eternal agony because of this de decision that he was going to make. Jesus couldn't stop him. God doesn't stop you from making the decisions you make. But it grieved him. It broke his heart. Have you ever thought about who is invited to this meal? Sinners, betrayers, who are the dinner guests of God? We are invited to this meal to feed our deepest needs, to feed our deepest hungers. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This meal feeds us at the most elemental levels. It sustains us when we are lost in the wilderness. This meal is there to help to bring us uh, home through all of our life. God required the Israelites to make this unleavened bread because they were going to leave in a hurry. You can't wait for it to rise. You just got to, you got to mix it together and throw it in the oven and let's go. But it was there to help sustain them through 40 years of wilderness wanderings. Here was bread that would last. It would not spoil. It was there for the long haul. It was there no matter what they would face. They would be able to have uh, bread for the journey. Jesus is that for us. He is bread for the wilderness times of our lives. He is bread for the, for the wearying times of our lives. And he is there through the long haul of our life. Through the wanderings in the wilderness, Jesus is there and he can sustain us. We need that kind of food in our life. Because we hunger for God, Jesus' blood poured out for the forgiveness, and that seals the covenant that we have. We have a hunger to have a relationship with God. We have, an, we have a tremendous need to, to be able to get through our entire life. We want to spend that life with Jesus Christ, with God, our Father. And so this bread gives us that nourishment and helps us to have that relationship with us. Jesus took his disciples back to Exodus chapter 24 when Moses secured the covenant with God through the blood that was sacrificed. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls. And the other half he sprinkled on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. Now the blood of the old covenant was sprinkled on the outside. The, the, the wine of the new covenant the blood of the new covenant is taken internally and changes us from the inside out. The blood of the old covenant could not change anybody. It could show that there was a change inside, but it couldn't do anything lasting. It couldn't do anything permanent. The blood of the new covenant can. Once again, blood had to be shed and a covenant established. 
We need this table. We need this service so that we can be, have this relationship with God. This juice that we take is a symbol that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. A, a relationship that is inside. It's not just outside. It's not just what we do. It's who we are on the inside. We are children of God, purchased with the blood of God's Son. The cup was the third of the, of the cups that was, was offered, at least we think so, in the Passover meal. The cup of redemption, celebrating God's promise uh, to these people. He says, and when they, when they drank that cup, they read these verses from Exodus, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Who would have thought that God's act of judgment would fall on Jesus Christ. Who would have thought that's what he was talking about? Instead of talking about the Egyptians or the Philistines or the Assyrians or the Babylonians, his justice fell on his son. That was the mighty act that that passage refers to because that act can take away our sin. Because we hunger for hope, this is the third thing that this meal feeds us with. Because we hunger for hope, this meal carries this promise you know, that Jesus Christ will be with us until the end of the age. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The fourth cup marked God's promise. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. A hope for the future. In our communion cup, we contain both the redemption and the promise in our one cup. God has promised us salvation. He has also promised us hope. Currently, God is gathering his people home, one at a time. A dad here, a friend there. One day, he will gather us all home. And there we will have the greatest, we will see the greatest hope of our hearts. We come to this simple meal again and again, month after month. But it does so much for us. It feeds our deepest hungers. It provides us with strength to last through the wilderness. It gives us a relationship with God. It gives us a hope for the future. This table does that for us. We have redemption. We know that Jesus is going to come again and take us to be with him. It is a meal rich with these ancient recipes of tears, of Passover lambs. It's ancient recipes designed to give us grace and freedom. It is a meal that lays open the secrets of our hearts. We are the betrayers. We are the sinners. Is it I, Lord? We ask that question every time we participate in communion. Did we betray Jesus? Yes. He is here to forgive us. And it is a meal that in some way brings us health. It brings us, it satisfies those hungers that we have. Communion has a lot of traditions around it. But there is just so much more. It is God telling us these eternal truths about our great need and his great love. Let's pray. Father, as we prepare for communion, we ask that you would help us to see the roots of this thing, the, the sin that we have committed, and your great love. We thank you for the hope. We thank you for the, the relationship that we can have. We thank you that it nourishes all of our needs, those needs that will last for all of our life however long you let us walk this earth. Lord, we pray that you would help us to celebrate communion today, knowing both our sin and your solution. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.